I'm Georgia. I'm the uh, founder of Sustainability Partnerships. Uh, we run webinars every month and this webinar is actually something quite different and interesting because um, in our last session in September, we did actually put a poll out to say, what would you guys like to hear next as opposed to us just scheduling what we think are the most pertinent uh, topics? So this one actually was crowdsourced from um, our audience um, in hearing um, that you guys are interested in this topic. So uh, jumping into the topic, uh, the future of sustainability in the NHS, a reuse and repurpose uh, revel uh, revolution. Uh, these are two key strategies that um, are being used to um, bring down that carbon footprint work towards uh, that 2040 goal uh, and we have some really interesting speakers on our webinar today who are going to see who are going to talk to us about how we can uh, work together collaborate and set ourselves some aims for um, how we can reuse and repurpose a little bit more confidently. So uh, we do have uh, on our speaker list today, we've got Stephen Hall, who's Managing Director of Silentia UK. Uh, we have Matt uh, Greenhill, who's Senior Sustainability Manager at WRM. And we have Steve Askew, uh, who's a Group uh, Director uh, of Sustainability and Client Engagement Lead at Circular uh, Computing. We also have on the call today, uh, Joan Stockdale, who's a specialist inventory manager at Leeds Teaching Hospitals, which we love to see because we're also based in Leeds. So we have a great affinity with the teaching hospitals uh, here in Leeds. She's going to be working uh, with Matthew um, on a bit of a case study that he's presenting today. So um, hello to everyone. Thanks so much for using that chat. Really great to see everyone uh, and all the energy here and really appreciate um, you guys engaging. We have the chat function for you to just put in all of your thoughts, comments, have conversations with each other. But if you do have a specific question for one of the uh, speakers, please put that in the Q&A function so I don't lose it in the chat. Um, we will have a QA and a um, after all of the presentations today. So if you have anything burning that you really want to ask uh, one of our speakers, they might um, type an answer back to you. Otherwise, we'll save the questions until the end. So um, I'm going to um, jump off and let Stephen Hall uh, jump straight on and go into his presentation today. Let us know a little bit more about Silencia, if anyone doesn't know who they are, uh, what you guys do, and let us know what you'll be presenting for us today, Stephen. Hey, super. Thanks, Georgia. Um, uh, as uh, Georgia said, I'm Stephen Hall, uh, Managing Director of Silencia UK. Uh, thanks very much, uh, everyone, for uh, taking the time to come uh, and uh, listen to me. We're, we're manufacturers of hygienic, uh, easy-to-clean uh, privacy screens. Uh, and today, um, I'm going to talk about um, what we sometimes call the elephant in the room, uh, and that is um, textile-based uh, curtains, which uh, are omnipresent uh, throughout our, our healthcare system. Um, I also uh, want to discuss the waste and energy consumption associated uh, with both disposable and washable curtains and introduce uh, a more reusable and more sustainable alternative. Um, I'll also uh, touch on how curtains prevent us from implementing good hygiene practices and the implications for infection control, um, because treating people who pick up uh, hospital-acquired infections also has a, a huge impact on our carbon footprint. So. Um, I'm just going to try and share my presentation. Um, uh, give me one second. And hopefully you can all uh, Perfect, see that. It's not working fine. Okay, great. Um, okay, so... Um, yeah, very dramatic statement. Every week, a uh, jumbo jet crashes in the UK uh, healthcare system. Um, I really just use that statement to illustrate the impact of hospital-acquired infections on, on our healthcare system and on our patients. Um, and what it really means is uh, every year, uh, our patients pick up around 834,000 infections, uh, leading to 28,500 deaths and costing the NHS around 2.7 billion. Uh, a year. 
apart from the human cost, uh, the cost in terms of uh, the carbon footprint is is huge. Uh, treatment of HAIs consumes around 7.1 million hospital bed days, days a year. That's estimated around 21% of all bed days in England. The cost in terms of CO2 equivalent emissions is around uh, 887.5 uh, million kilograms per year or 887,000 kilotons uh, per year. So curtains uh, make a significant contribution towards that HII risk. Uh, they are a frequently touched surface. They're close to the patient and are a proven source of pathogens. Um, studies have shown that 92% uh, of curtains, uh, privacy curtains, are contaminated within one week of laundering. So that means that some are becoming contaminated almost as soon as they're installed. Um, I sort of mentioned that this elephant in the room, um, and one example to sort of illustrate that is the opportunity that was, I feel was missed in uh, the 2021 uh, National Standards of Cleanliness Guidelines. It was published by the NHS. So this report basically identified high frequency touch points uh, throughout the hospital and recommended uh, cleaning frequencies for, you know, for each of those touch points, depending on the, the risk of the area in which they were located. Amazingly, I mean, you can see the sort of uh, items that were highlighted, light switches, tap suspensors, door handles, uh, bed rails, um, all the sorts of things that are commonly touched within the hospital. But amazingly, curtains were completely missing from that list, uh, it, almost as if they didn't exist. And we all know they very much do exist in hospitals. Um, and we certainly can't deny that they're one of the most frequently touched surfaces in our hospitals. But what, what is interesting in this report is the frequency uh, uh, that um, uh, the, the report, uh, the guidelines recommend that surfaces should be uh, cleaned. So if you look at you know patient beds and light switches and sockets um, and data points, you know uh, in the high frequency, or sorry, high risk areas, uh, FR1, FR2, uh, they're recommending that these should be cleaned on a on a daily basis. Um, and in the lower risk areas weekly up to fortnightly when it comes to curtains and blinds um they're basically saying uh refer to the local curtain changing program or you know as a minimum every six months or when visibly soiled and uh, it just seems a huge uh inconsistency uh and i just wonder uh was um you know, is part of the reason for this, the, the fact that uh, it would be just hugely impractical and hugely costly to clean curtains uh, or replace curtains on a, on a daily basis. Um, having said that, I think that was the case in some hospitals uh, you know, throughout the UK during COVID. Uh, you know, disposable curtains were being sort of switched out every every day. Uh, obviously not, not practical and uh, extremely costly. Um, this chart sort of illustrates the uh, environmental impact of our curtain changing policy. And uh, if we sort of uh, increase the curtain, curtain changing frequency uh, going to the right, you'll see that um, hopefully as we increase uh, curtain changing, curtain cleaning, the CO2 impact of hospital acquired infections go down um, because there are fewer infections. But at the same time, um, uh, you know, the uh, the actual cost of replacing those curtains and cleaning those curtains goes up. Um, so there's there's a the two are inextricably linked. Uh, the 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 more we change our curtains, uh, you know, the, the the bigger the impact of that activity on on uh, on the environment. Um, so I mean, at Silencia, we believe it's it's time for a radical rethink on our approach to patient privacy. So instead of of tweaking the problem of, of curtains and how to minimize waste or improve recycling methods, why not just uh, eliminate the problem altogether? You know, why not choose something which can be quickly and easily wiped down uh, as and when required, uh, rather relying on the time consuming and inconvenient uh, changing protocols, which ultimately at the end of the day still don't deliver uh, the sorts of infection uh, control levels and the ability to maintain high levels of hygiene that, that we require in the acute environment. Um, Silencia is a Swedish company. It was founded in 1989, primarily to design uh, um, uh, something which improved uh, privacy for the patient. Um, 
So, yeah, the challenge that was posed uh, that, that something better is needed in place of curtains. Uh, this is one of the first screens installed in uh, Vexu Central Hospital uh, in Sweden in 1990. Uh, today, Vexu is a curtain free hospital uh, with many of those original screens installed nearly 34 years ago, still in service. Uh, and during that time, you can just imagine the thousands of curtain replacements and washes that those screens have uh, replaced during their lifetime. So from starting off as an improved uh, privacy solution in 1990, um, uh, the benefits in relation to hygiene uh, were, were recognized uh, as the screens could be very easily uh, and quickly kept clean. Um, I'm sure you'd agree that every patient has the right to a clean and hygienic care environment, and that's very much uh, the main driving force behind uh, uh, the products that we develop. Uh, by 2003, uh, the original design had evolved, evolved into a, a comprehensive modular system, uh, which can be used to create flexible and hygienic spaces uh, fit for the acute environment. And here are just some examples of the over 4,000 possible combinations um, uh, that you can use uh, with the Silentia uh, screen system. Uh, in more recent years, sustainability has become another important reason to move from curtains to screens. Um, and as a result, over this time, uh, we've come to develop five uh, guiding principles um, uh, for our products. Um, first one, obviously, is, is hygiene. Uh, uh, that's essential, uh, optimizing infection prevention and control. Um, privacy solutions should be safe. Uh, safe to use, reliable uh, and, and user-friendly. Uh, they should also be durable. Um, uh, our screens, I will come on to some examples, have been built to last. Uh, you, you've already seen the ones that were installed uh, over 30 years ago, uh, still in use. Uh, so durability is a, is a key uh, part of our design. And we should expect our screens to last at least 10 years, um, uh, many more than that. Uh, reusability. Um, is important, and that uh, you know by building by keeping the design simple um, uh, and uh, compatible uh, and modular, that means our screens can be very easily repurposed. And I'll also touch on some examples of of, of how that's been done with our products. Um, we have had examples of customers you know who've finished using uh, have no longer a need for certain screens. They've put them on the uh, the hospital local internet system. And uh, other hospitals have, uh, have ordered them off that system because of the the modular design. We've been able to, you know, uh, tweak the installation a little bit, maybe by making uh, a wall mounted screen mobile by asking by adding a trolley uh, or or making uh, a mobile screen wall mounted by uh, you know supplying a, a a wall mounting for that. So the screens are are, are modular modular and designed to be repurposed um, if uh, needs as and when needs change in the hospital. Um, and another important factor is they they should be repaired, uh, and our screens that you know have a minimal and simple design uh, with materials that allow for easy uh, and local maintenance. Just by way of illustrating the environmental benefits of moving from curtains to screens, um, I, I've made an assumption that on average hospital curtains are changed uh, around once per month. Uh, we have some data to back that up. Uh, because even in hospitals with, uh, uh, I mean, we've all seen uh, disposable curtains that have been hanging there for, for months, and that does happen. But um, on average, uh, uh, you know, whether it's due to uh, patients changing or uh, outbreaks or, uh, or whatever, uh, we have data from other hospitals that show that on average, uh, curtains are changed around about once a month. Of course, that will vary uh, dramatically from department to department. Um, I've also looked at a 10 year period because we expect our screens to last uh, a minimum of 10 years. Um, so over 10 years, changing once per month, that's about 120 curtain changes if they're disposable or 120 curtain washes um, or washable curtains. In the case of disposable curtains, that amounts to around um, uh, 140 to 360 kilograms of, of plastic uh, being used. And also you've got the associated labor transport and logistical costs uh, with that. Uh, in relation to uh, launderable curtains, uh, you're talking about using 12 to 16,000 liters of wastewater 
and uh, using about three and three thousand six hundred kilowatts uh, of energy, as well again as the labour transport and the logistics associated with that. Uh, by comparison, um, ten years of privacy from one screen. Uh, uh, you know, instead of one hundred forty to three hundred sixty kilos of plastic, we're talking around sixteen kilograms of materials, uh, many of which are uh, uh, recyclable or from new renewable sources. Resource efficiency also means cost efficiency. Uh, and whilst, yeah, a, a screen is more expensive than a curtain, uh, a slanted screen should pay for itself in less than three years. And uh, here are some uh, examples uh, of recent installations, but we also have many examples uh, in both the UK and from other countries to support uh, where screens are still in service after 10 years, but you can see um, you know, how clean and hygienic the, the patient environment looks um, when our screens are in place. Uh, one uh, example in the UK, uh, Golden Jubilee Hospital in Glasgow, um, and we installed 157 screens in 2011, and uh, they're still in service uh, you know, after, after 12 years. We already mentioned the, the, the first screens installed in, in Vexu. Uh, many of those are still in service, and that hospital is, uh, has been curtain-free um, for uh, since then. Uh, similar example, similar age of screen uh, in Antwerp University Hospital, almost 33 years old. Uh, but since then, you know, the, the quality of our screens has really improved. The design has changed a little bit. Uh, but obviously, with uh, improvements in materials and technologies, uh, you know the reliability and uh, durability of our screens has only improved. Um, and just to illustrate that durability, um, we installed around fourteen hundred screens in Aarhus uh, University Hospital uh, in Denmark. Um, they were delivered between six and eight years ago, and since then we've only had five repairs, uh, and those were due to accidental damage, uh, not due to uh, any sort of warranty. Uh, product failure. I'd also like to mention uh, the new uh, Goodstrup Regional Hospital uh, in Denmark because um, it illustrates, um, you know, how easily our screens can be repurposed and reused. So this was a new super hospital which uh, was built to replace the two old uh, local hospitals in the area at uh, around four hundred nine beds, three and a half thousand employees. And there's a real desire to recycle as much as possible to make the project, uh, you know, as sustainable and economical as possible. So where, where possible existing equipment was saved and repurposed. And as part of that, um, uh, sorry, we've gone too far. Uh, as part of that, um, uh, 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 around 100 uh, Silencio screens were repurposed uh, from the old hospitals into the, into the new hospital. You'll see on the image on the left that each of our screens comes uh, with uh, a barcode, which uniquely identifies that screen and the model and the dimensions. So we were able to give uh, the architects the CAD drawings, uh, you know, to allow them to drop, uh, to basically catalog the screens and drop them into the new plans for the new hospital. Uh, and then the team at Silencia assisted um, uh, you know, the, the hospital to relocate those screens uh, and saving, obviously, uh, you know, significant amount of money and around 1.6 tons of materials. Uh, we've lost more case studies uh, on our website. You're very, very welcome to browse those uh, for yourself uh, from both the UK and uh, all around the world. Um, uh, we're present in over 50 countries around the world. Um, and uh, uh, there, there are lots of uh, stories uh, to learn from. Uh, here's just a few of our customers from the UK. Um, uh, uh, and uh, you know, also very happy to um, to use those as uh, reference sites. Um, this is our headquarters in Sweden. Um, it's uh, it runs on one hundred percent renewable energy uh, based on wind wind power. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we're also working on several uh, uh, sustainability initiatives. Um, so. By next year, we should be able to identify the uh, the exact carbon footprint of each of our products. Um, uh, we'll have that sustainability recording in place. Uh, that's something that uh, the NHS is going to require anyway by 2028. Um, we're developing a circular economy program to allow uh, screen components to be recycled at the end of uh, their life. 
many of the raw materials that we use are are sourced locally in Northern Europe, and a large percent uh, are are made from recycled or recyclable materials. So that's really everything for me. Thank you very much for your time. I hope we didn't run over too much. Um, uh, I'll now pass back to Georgia. Thanks, Stephen. I really appreciate that. You. Uh, you did have one question here from Sophia, but if Sophia, if you're if you're happy for us to just um get Stephen to either type an answer to that um in the chat function there, or if uh, if we can uh, verbally address that at the end uh, in the Q and A session, um. Uh, really interesting to find out about um, curtains being changed once a month. It would be great to know if anyone um, in the audience today, if any of you guys are responsible for or involved with um, that um, that function, it would be great to know if, if you feel that it is once a month or if you feel like it's more or less than that. Uh, it would be great, I think, for Stephen's uh, knowledge as well to like maybe um, have some updated stats from a lot of trusts in the UK uh, as to what's happening with you guys and just your feeling around that kind of stuff as well. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you to either answer that. Um, um, yourself, uh, Stephen, and uh, we'll move straight on to Steve, not to be confused with Stephen. Two Stephen, Steve's on the call uh, in one day. Um, it's a pleasure for us to, to bring you in. Uh, Steve, if you can please introduce yourself and let us know what you're talking about today. Thank you very much indeed, Georgia. Uh, my name is Steve Haskew. I am the Group Sustainability Director for a business called Circular Computing. Uh, we are a supplier of laptop technology and uh, just jumping into this, we will explore so let's have a so before we start um have a look at your mobile phones or the device that is given to you as a mobile phone because actually it isn't a mobile phone it is whatever the supplier of the app that you're using on the device suggests it could be so that could be a newspaper it could be social media it could be text whatsapp so um email it could be a tv so what we do know is that it's made up of a, a composition of things on the periodic table. And the premise of the circular economy is to, is to not forage for things that have already been uh, made to keep in, in, um, in life the products that have been made for as long as you possibly can and to avoid waste and be regenerative. Um, but just picking away at the say, mobile phone, when your phone vibrates, it's a combination of these three things. Tungsten is particularly interesting here in that it is part of another set called the three TGs, which is made up of conflict minerals. So minerals that are, are from a zone of the world where um, that zone is controlled by a militia state. So um, the DRC, Democratic Republic of Cong Congo, is, is well known for this. And tungsten comes from there. So every time that we just take, make, use and dispose of an asset that's made up of tungsten, we, we are by design, if we're rebuying re another asset made of the same material, asking that material to be sourced from the conflict zone. We have that liability and it's, it's really just ex exploring the fact that we need to make a better decision. And then if you have a look at the geopolitical condition of the world today, um, you know, we have an embargo, say, against Russia and the supply of products from Russia. A large percentage of palladium, global palladium, comes from Russia. Uh, a circuit board can't work without palladium, which means, therefore, that we need to source palladium from another pool of product from somewhere else in the world, which then increases the, 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 the price per unit, which then obviously moves on to the consumer use. So having a, a process and a, and a thinking in your procurement is more sustainable, will create resilience and, and, and self-sufficiency is how we see it. And that's not just for laptops, of course. Everything that's required within the uh, modern um, healthcare society requires the very same products that are contained within a mobile phone or within a laptop. You know, you could say the same about wind, solar and hydro technology, electric vehicles um, and all of the building back better on, on the green agenda require the very same component technology that a laptop needs. So when you feel the pinch about, you know, I've ordered an electric vehicle, I want to move that way, uh, but you can't get delivery for nine or 12 months because there's nothing in the supply chain to help you or help your delivery. This is the reason why is that the, the supply chain needs to balance between where its assets go. Uh, 
Yes, Steve, we don't have audio on the video. So oh, do you not? If you want to explain all that, if that's okay. Yeah, it just says circular computing on the future. Literally, they were brilliant. And <laughs> you shouldn't live without it. Essentially, what it says, Georgia, is that we've got into a behavior pattern where the um, that where consumption is at a pace that needn't exist. We've just got kind of bought into the idea that buying brand new shiny every three years is necessary. And it's no longer that way. Products within our, our uh, field are as thin as they're going to get and as fast as they're going to, going to need to be for the average user. So like today, I'm using a, a, a product that is a no, no, you know, no surprise, it's a circular computing laptop. It does the job for the general office worker, for those people that need absolute raw power, then, um, then they'll, they'll need to go somewhere else. But we should be part of the solution is sort of what it says. Um, so what we say when we have a quick look at this slide is, is everybody's focus at the moment with say carbon around the powering of stuff, electricity, renewable energy, and the transportation of stuff, uh, electric vehicles and so forth, which is right, you know, we need to do better. But actually a massive slug that we can really look at is the making of stuff. Now contained within there is uh, cement and steel, which is a big one, but if we're able to reduce how much stuff we, we make from factories that consume fossil fuels, then we're gonna reduce um, our CO2 and, and our ambitions to moving towards a net zero rely heavily on a circular economy. So we use this as a, um, as a, a piece that um, kind of shows the, the delicate balance between focusing on carbon, which is where the world's focused at the moment, but, but resource scarcity, uh, overconsumption and so forth. So we would say that a, a, a decarbonized future state does not exist without a circular economy, that we need to think about reuse, uh, repurposing, uh, extending the life of assets, and by so doing, will have an, an indirect impact on the um, on the climate as well. Um, this is a uh, a selection of clients that actually use our services. So, um, as you can see, there's there's, there's people there that, that you will ever know. But focusing on the audience today, if we looked at at these three organisations um, very quickly. When you dial 999 in the east of England, it, it's our technology that answers the, the call. Um, the CDIO and CIO there and Deputy C, C, CDIO are really vocal and are really um, happy to help us promote circularity within the NHS. So as is NELF, as is, as is uh, King's College Hospital, who recently did a, um, they were doing an install in, in um, King's College in Thomas and St. Guys in St. Thomas. Uh, where they were were um, using um, our product to train on on Epic, sort of um, the EPR stuff. So uh, we have really good um, case studies within the NHS um, and within NHS England. They see ICT as a um, as a driving force to help with their CO2 ambition. And again, it goes down to how you how you procure. So if you're able to procure laptops from a source that is not a a brand new source, then you're doing well. So actually within the video, if, if that's okay, George, within the video, it says something really important. And what's really important that makes us different to everybody else is that we've, we've been able to, to work with the British Standards Institution over the last eight years or so. Um, who, and they come and audit us every year. In 2021, they gave us a kite mark that specifies that our products are equal to or better than new. So when the buyer buys a product from us, it's not a brand new product. It has been used once before, but we, re we return it back to a brand new state. So it's not refurbished or, or reconditioned. This is rebuilt from, from its core component technology. And the buying experience for the user um, is that of new. The benefit being is about a 40% saving from the get-go. Um, you're not... When you buy a brand new laptop, um, you're actually putting 331 kilos of CO2 into the atmosphere is the average. By using a, a remanufactured device from circular computing, that, that event is prevented. Clearly, we are conserving resources. Um, there's a massive water footprint with 
creating technology, and this will apply to all, all forms of technology within the NHS, but particularly with the laptops, there's 190,000 litres of water per device um, produced, brand new, which obviously in the UK, when you turn in a tap on and off, it's not a, a big thing, but in parts of the world where water is, a, is the most valuable of resources, it is a, it is a big deal. Um, and we have a reforestation initiative, which is um, becoming quite mainstream now, but seven or eight years ago when we started, we didn't have a tree planted and now we're, we're close to sort of 500,000 trees. This needs updating slightly. Um, we plant five trees for every laptop that, that, that we sell um, as a part of a social value proposition. Um, and that's me. If you'd like to know more or have more information, I'm sorry about the video, everybody. Uh, but if you'd like some more information, then then please feel free to to reach out to me or, or um, one of the team on the call. But thank you, Georgia. Thanks, Steve. Um, so sorry about uh, about the video. We should have tested that in our uh, in our session before. But um, you had some really nice transitions in that presentation. I might uh, hit you up to ask about um, how to make those nice uh, animations and stuff. It looked really cool. Um, no I think that um, it's it's really interesting that we're all talking a lot more about the supply chain, inspecting the supply chain, pushing the on us of genuine sustainability right down to the source. Um, you know, uh, Stephen mentioned it and since running sustainability partnerships for the last three years, it's something that's crept in a lot more when I think that we used to just talk about sustainable alternatives um, on a face value. And now we're talking about, okay, well, you know, your product needs to be sustainable, you know, but St Stephen was talking about, well, you know, we're looking at sustainable practices and um, our offices are run on um, renewable energy. And I think going right down at the source and not just talking about how sustainable those supply chains are, but also how ethical um, and some of those um, precious metals and things that you're talking about and where they come from. Um, I think that it's it's really great for, the, for you to create be creating that awareness of that because I think a lot of people don't actually know about the, the value of some of the stuff that's inside the tech that you have in your hands um, and how that should be reused. So really, really appreciate that insight today. Um, we're going to move on um, to you, Matt, and, and Joan. Um, are you all right with your tech, Matt? I know that you've uh, let me know about the, some um, connectivity issues. Uh, I hope so. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, great. Yeah, it was just a moment 15 minutes ago where everything kind of froze. Um, but uh, yeah, I suppose that's uh, what happens when you're located in the room, the opposite side of the house to where your internet router is. So, <laughs> so um, um, if anyone does have any questions, uh, we're going to be running them after um, Matt and uh, Joanne's um talk so please put them in the Q&A uh, and we'll go through them after this and I'll let you take that away please Matt. Yeah, great. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, that's perfect. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Greenhill. I work as a senior sustainability consultant for a company called WRM. Um, WRM uh, are a business which provides strategic advice and support to organizations to reduce their carbon footprints and ultimately become more sustainable organizations. Um, and for a number of years now, we've um, been supporting NHS trusts uh, and suppliers into the NHS with their uh, sustainability ambitions. So in my role, um, I uh, oversee a range of different projects, green plans, uh, carbon reduction plans, carbon footprints, etc. Um, but uh, with WRM, uh, I'm also seconded to lead teaching hospitals as uh, in-house sustainability support and uh, manager. Um, and in that role, we are kind of doing everything from um, kind of liaising with stakeholders to uh, generate action uh, for the trust screen plan, uh, leading staff engagement campaigns, and also um, getting involved in sustainable procurement aspects as well. So today I will be uh, talking about a project that the trust has undertaken, which showcases aspects of sustainable procurement and circular economy. Um, a bit of a broader perspective, I think, um, perhaps not just reuse and repurpose, but more broadly and, and the carbon impact we see from the, the whole supply chain. Um, and uh, today, uh, as George has mentioned, I'm joined by Joe Stockdale, who is a specialist inventory manager at the hospital. Um, and she's here to answer any questions that anyone might have about this particular project. So uh, firstly, just a bit of background to sustainability at Leeds Teaching Hospitals. 
Um, I'm just going to abbrevi abbreviate that to LTHT. Um, of course, we're probably all familiar with the content on the screen now. Uh, in 2020, the NHS became the first healthcare system in the world to commit to achieving net zero emissions. Um, obviously, for 2040, uh, for our direct emissions and 2045 for our indirect emissions. And these are targets that LTHT, um, amongst uh, every other NHS trust as well, um, is all working towards um, achieving these national uh, targets for the NHS. <clears throat> so LTHT has been monitoring its carbon footprint for several years. Um, the graph on the screen shows you the carbon impact of the trust in line with uh, a range of different resource consumption aspects. Uh, and this includes everything from uh, gas, oil and fleet over on the left there uh, to kind of anaesthetic gas use, uh, inhalers, uh, electricity, water and clinical and non-clinical waste. And since 2013-14, which is our carbon baseline year, we've achieved a 33% reduction in our carbon footprint. And our current annual carbon footprint is 56,000 tonnes of uh, CO2 equivalent. Um, I think it's fair to say that the amount of carbon emissions associated with procurement and supply chain <clears throat> um, is, you know, quite substantial, as we're probably all aware. Um, and in 2021, LTH commissioned an organisation to calculate its scope three emissions, uh, and these total 277,000 tonnes. So it's really providing there a clear imperative for the trust to act where it can do to reduce its scope three carbon impact. The Trust launched its first green plan in 2020, and this was updated in 2022 to reflect a renewed commitment to uh, the sustainability agenda in line with new national guidance. Um, the plan has been approved by the board and essentially details uh, the range of actions that the Trust is going to take to decarbonise and achieve its net zero targets. Um, critically, one of the biggest themes in this green plan is about embedding sustainability into the trust's procurement processes. Um, so, you know, including criteria within tenders, uh, monitoring the carbon impact of the purchases that the trust makes, um, and uh, also exploring sustainable solutions to our waste as well. So, one of the key projects to have taken place uh, in recent years is the Dolly Lane project. As you might imagine, uh, LTHT, very large uh, hospital trust, um, the delivery of the trust services relies on the procurement of a huge variety of goods, um, ranging from uh, anything from medical devices to equipment, medicines, ICT and other manufactured products. Historically, these have all been delivered to the trust by couriers who would drive from their warehouses to each of our trust's hospital sites. And our trust has five different uh, main hospital sites. And the whole kind of premise of Dolly Lane um, was that it was set up to centralise these, these deliveries um, in a way which would not only um, save time and be more efficient uh, financially, but also with the added benefit of having that environmental pro <clears throat> so instead of each supplier delivering to um, every site, suppliers will now deliver to one site, i.e. Dolly Lane, um, in a seven ton truck. And then after those goods are delivered, um, they are transported via uh, electric vehicles of the trust, um, respectively and individually to our own hospital sites. And as we'll go on to see, this has substantially reduced the number of annual deliveries of goods that the trust has um, received. So in terms of the actual chain and process, when the items are delivered, they are taken um, uh, to um, each of the respective sites via EVs. The packaging is then sent back via EVs uh, to Dolly Lane um, and also kind of uh, amalgamated with other um, plastic and cardboard wastes as well. Um, once it arrives back at Dolly Lane, uh, the waste cardboard and plastic uh, are then dealt with. The cardboard is put through a baling machine, which processes 
the cardboard to produce half ton blocks uh, and the waste plastic which includes the likes of theatre tray wraps is all gathered and collected and compressed um, to to make blocks as well and then these are uh, collected by suppliers um, to be made into fresh packaging um, for products procured by the trust so for this project specifically, uh, LTHT asked us at WRM to calculate the carbon impact of this process uh, and the positive changes that have been made. Um, as many of you might be aware, quantification of carbon and carbon assessments is really becoming an increasing um, priority and importance, not only in showcasing the uh, sustainability pros and cons of a project before it's uh, commissioned and implemented, um, but also uh, from a retrospective lens, um, showcasing positive work that a organization has done. Uh, and, and in this case, um, the carbon assessment undertaken by us here um, has been done to showcase this uh, positive work of the trust. So it's a bit difficult to make a carbon assessment look exciting. I think um, I've tried to jazz it up a bit with some diagrams and uh, some graphs. Unfortunately, no videos from myself, um, but uh, hopefully this, this Kind of chain here gives you a, a good overview of the process. So WRM began their carbon assessment by managing uh, and mapping out the life cycle of uh, a typical product that comes into the trust, um, both in its pre-implementation and post-implementation phase. Um, on the screen, you can see the post-implementation phase of the project with uh, the deliveries going into Dolly Lane before being sent to the trust sites and the new uh, waste management arrangements. And by doing this, we were able to identify each stage within the chain uh, in which carbon would be emitted. So here, uh, just bringing up some, uh, well, this is the extent of my PowerPoint abilities, um, carbon emissions from uh, travel by suppliers to Dolly Lane, uh, the impact of EV travel, of course, it still has an impact um, and the impact of that uh, travel to our respective trust sites, um, back to Dolly Lane, and then um, the CO2 emitted from the waste treatment process as well, uh, in this case being uh, recycling. It should be noted that we haven't included the travel by the supplier after um, the waste collection, um, and this is uh, something that we are going to do um, in the future to uh, make this assessment more well-rounded uh, and to get a more accurate carbon impact for um, the process. So in terms of the courier delivery aspect of the assessment, we collected data on trips made by um, suppliers to the trust, both before and after the project. Um, as you can see here, uh, before the uh, project began um, with all of the deliveries going to these respective hospitals um, there were over 18,000 trips um, made by suppliers and that was distributed across all of these five sites that, that you can see in the top bar chart here. After the introduction of Dolly Lane uh, this has been reduced to approximately 8,800 um, which we have calculated uh, saving over 50 tonnes of CO2. Um, should say these calculations, uh, like any calculation um, with carbon, are based on some assumptions. So we've taken a 10 mile delivery distance here as an assumption for working this out. Um, and we've also used an averaged carbon factor, uh, which was based on a mixture of petrol, diesel and EV supplier vehicles, which is, uh, which is the, the, the current situation as far as I'm aware um, regarding the supplier deliveries. In terms of internal transport, uh, we collected data on trips made uh, internally after the delivery uh, by the supplier via our EV 18 tonne truck. Um, to be clear, this comparison and this part of the project um, is a comparison between the 2021 situation when Dolly Lane was set up, but um, two diesel vans were used rather than EV vehicles um, or electric vehicles uh, to transport the goods internally. Um, and uh, as you can see here, previously there were over 2,000 trips made 
to each uh, site internally, um, but with the introduction of a larger EV vehicle to do so, um, this has been reduced to approximately 600, 650 um, trips, which has uh, saved approximately eight tonnes of carbon. Uh, and then finally, um, in terms of the actual waste and, and repurposing side of the project, um, we collected data on cardboard and plastic uh, that was sent for recycling. Uh, in 2021, approximately 75 tonnes um, across, both, across both types of waste was recycled. Um, after the introduction of Dolly Lane and the recycling facilities, uh, this increased to uh, 425 tonnes uh, and that's just a figure so far in 2023 so this will um, most likely increase uh, going into the, the back end of this year. So I think it's great to see that more packaging is now being recycled than before. Um, ironically this has led to a greater carbon impact than previous uh, with nine tons of co2 compared to the 1.5 tons simply due to more material being recycled um, however i think the key win is the uh, is obviously the carbon avoided from the waste not going into um, kind of more carbon intensive waste streams um, and this is an additional uh, carbon benefit that uh, that we are working to add to this carbon assessment so the project uh, and the carbon assessment was was finished there uh, and we've worked out the overall carbon saved from uh, the Dolly Lane project uh, currently stands at 55.1 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year, um, which I think is really great. Uh, we've gone in for a uh, national award um, for this project um, and we are awaiting to hear kind of the outcome um, of our application for that award there. But yeah, I think some really uh, positive work being done by the trust um, and that is more or less my part uh, other than just uh, an offer for questions and also obviously a, a plug-in for WRM services if you're interested in uh, in asking us to, to do any of these pieces of work that might be relevant to you uh, please feel free to get in touch thanks thanks so much uh, Matt um Joanne, I know that you've just been brought in to ask to be asked uh, asked questions and to answer anything. But um, did you want to give us maybe just a, a top line understanding of of your involvement and and what difference you think that you feel has been made since the the project started? Yes, Georgia, of course. Obviously, um, I mean we've been down at Dolly Lane now for the past three years. Um, we started the the scheme where we we're going to centralise all the hospitals, well, the five the five main loading bays. We started that in October 2021. So we started with a very small unit, which was Seacroft Hospital, um, which still we, we did about 60 receipts a week, which isn't in a lot, but that was the starting process. And we've recently, that's just finished September, we've just actually centralised the LGI goods there. So we closed that two weeks ago. So it's, it is all coming in now to a centralised location. It's been it's been a long sort of eighteen months, but you know we've got there, got there in the end. Um, obviously, I'm happy to have, I'm, ask so many questions, um, but it's just working now on obviously making sure we, we get the deliveries because we get all the career deliveries now, including theatres across sites. We've got to ensure those theatres are priority because we've obviously we're not being on a site like the LGI where we've got the major trauma theatres we're actually kind of taking the direct deliveries to a different site. We've got to ensure we can get logistically any urgence across there. So that, that's the tough bit now, just making sure we deliver everything in a timely manner that's coming into the centralised location. Because obviously we're on the, we're based on the St. James's site. Mm. Uh, but so, yeah, it's just logistically now making sure we continue to get all the deliveries out, mm -hmm. which we are doing up to now, you know, we are. And then there's going to be a bit of disruption in the next few years as well with the brand new green hospital that's being built in Leeds as well. So interested to see how you guys are going to work with how that's being built, because obviously that's sustainable um, from design. So I'm, I'm sure you guys are, are thinking about how you're going to be implementing with that new hospital. And then potentially, who knows, we might, as much as we've become a centralised, we might be taking more, you know, we might act as a, you know, as a centralised delivery point for other other areas and as we take on projects across 
um, across our trust as well, including like the new pathology. Uh, we've had a new pathology building, you know, sort of built, which is due to sort of be up and running by 2024. Mm. Potentially, you know, we've got more coming on board as well. So it's, yeah, quite a big project. You've got a question here, uh, Matt, about when you talk about supplier transporting the waste back, is it the original supplier taking uh, the waste back or is it an independent uh, supplier for the trust? Uh, Joe, do you know the answer to that one? Yeah, what it is, we, it's independent suppliers that they, we call in and they take that. Obviously, like Matt says, we probably need to get a bit more detail on, on those areas. Uh, but as it's kind of quite a recent project, it's, you know, certainly that's running out of the warehouses, it's probably more info we'd have to sort of feedback. Um, oh, you've got a question also here from David about um, the Teaching Hospital Trust. Uh, have you installed EV charging points to support the Leeds de delivery vehicles? Yes, yeah, so currently what we did, we've had them probably now, probably nearly two years, 18 months. We've got them on the BET scheme which is the trial the trial service. Um, so at the moment we don't own the two vehicles. We have we got two vehicles. Basically one was one was taken on for transport department and one was taken on for uh, the trust as in warehousing and logistics. But currently we've taken on both of them transport. It wasn't it wasn't really working for transport, so we kind of took them on. So what happened when we took them on? We had one charger put at Dolly Lane, which is here, and we had one based at Seacroft. We're just in the process now of getting the Seacroft one moved to Dolly Lane. So we'll have both of them here. Because obviously we're, we're switching kind of, you know, working out through the day, the schedules, making sure we can get the, you know, the, the trucks charged up. But it's working at the moment. But when we get the other one moved, it will, yeah. So currently we've got two, two vans and two chargers. Okay, great. David, hopefully that um, is a, enough of an answer there. Uh, Matt, are you all right to stop sharing your screen? Um, just so that we can see uh, all of the the speakers. Um, uh, there was a question also about whether or not the presentations will be made available. They're always made available. This entire um, event has been recorded. That will be going out on our YouTube channel. We will then have... Um, a uh, write-up on our blog where all of the contact details of all of our speakers, all of the uh, presentations and that video will all be made available to everyone um, who signed up. You'll receive a link to that um, on email. Um, I do appreciate that we've had a lot of people um, asking for contact details. Um, Jade from NHS Supply Chain, I appreciate that that you've been on and I know that you've been speaking um, a lot uh, to the guys at um, supply chain, so Sophia at supply chain as well. Um, I also appreciate that we've been hearing from our uh, counterparts in Ireland. Always great to have you guys on as well uh, at the HSC. Uh, so uh, again, um, if anyone wants to get in touch with Helen, she's posted her contact details there as well. Uh, were there any other questions for um, our panellists uh, before I move on to some of the other things that we've got coming up? Um, I will chat through that now. If there's anything else, any other comments or questions, obviously add them um, as we go. Uh, Matt, you did mention that you are signing up for an award. Um, just to let everyone know that the 2023 uh, Sustainability Awards with Sustainability Partnerships are now open. Um, if one of my uh, team can please drop the link uh, where people can apply for the awards um, in the chat there, you can sign up. We have awards specifically for NHS trusts and we have awards specifically for businesses in the supply chain to the NHS as well. So if you are looking to uh, get involved with that, please uh, click that link that has just now been posted. Find out a little bit about our awards. Uh, and they'll be going live in uh, they're, they're live now but uh, we will be awarding them in February of next year um, other events that we have coming up are um, our next webinar is the Field to Fork Sustainability in Nutrition, which is, again, really, really important going back to some, things, some of the stuff that Steve was saying about how global economics can um, develop out um, the importance of scarcity in supply chain. And I know that we've all been feeling a lot about that with some of the um, unfortunate wars and things that have been happening and, and some of the food shortages and things that we've had to deal with 
if there's a result of that type of thing. So um, the field to fork um, and it is going to be uh, talking a lot about how there's uh, sustainability and nutrition and how we're going to be a little bit more local uh, about procuring um, some of the food into to hospitals and things. So that's going to be really, really interesting one that's coming up um, on the 22nd of November. So if one of my team can please post the link to that, that would be super helpful. Um, is there, I think there might be a question. Oh no, I've answered that one. Um, from Lynn. So finally, I also wanted to let everyone know that Sustainability Partnerships will be sponsoring the uh, sustainable med tech um, panel at the MedTech Innovation Assembly in Leeds on the 2nd of November. So that uh, event is an all day event um, and they'll be having talks on things like cybersecurity, AI, um, investment into med tech. Uh, they'll have um, representatives from trusts all over the country, from Leeds, Newcastle, Cambridge, West Midlands, Manchester, um, Scotland will all be coming to Leeds on the 2nd of November. And um, this event is free for the NHS. We'll be sending out an email to our entire database uh, this week about this event because we're very proud to be um, involved with the sustainability panel specifically. I know that we one of our attendees today is, is actually on that panel, uh, Matt Cooling. So appreciate uh, you coming along today and looking forward to seeing you on the 2nd of November. Um, Matt and Joanne, hopefully we'll see you guys there. You've got no excuse. You're just literally across the road from Nexus. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you guys uh, there. Everyone else, um, you are obviously invited to that. If one of my team could please post the, um, there you go, about the um, uh, MedTech Innovation Assembly. Have a look at that. We've got some great speakers um, on our sustainability panel um, and we hope to see uh, have the chance to see some of you there as well. Um, some of the speakers, do you do have any comments or questions for each other uh, from today's session, from what you've learned? Not you all seem to be um, pretty happy with what we've done. So um, that just leaves me then to say thank you so much for all of you for sharing uh, your insight. I know that we could always talk for a little bit longer about these kinds of things, but we really appreciate that you've come on today to talk about the uh, the reuse and repurpose uh, revolution because it is really important for us to not just think about how we can bring down carbon footprint in terms of things like um, the manufacturing and supply chain, but how we can just reuse some of the stuff that, we, that we've already got in our hands um and we hope to see everyone again um, at our webinar next uh, month if not in leeds on the second um so it just remains to say thank you much to stephen steve joanne and matthew for coming today and presenting uh thank you as always to all of our attendees for giving up an hour of your time and being so um engaged and uh and passionate in in the comments we always really appreciate everyone uh giving back to this community um, and getting involved. So thanks so much for everyone. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye for now then.